So this morning, I want to talk to you about stop before you flop. And uh, before I do that, Ethan and Joy, you guys are just so awesome. And uh, to see the maturity and to see the growth is just off the charts. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for, for today. That was such a blessing. Well, I want to give credit to uh, Craig Rochelle because uh, this whole stop before you flop idea came from a chapter from his book, uh, The Power to Change. It's his brand new book. Um, if, for those of you who are going, who's Craig Rochelle? If you guys use the YouVersion Bible app, you know Craig Rochelle because he's the one responsible for it, and it's his church, Life Church, out in Oklahoma City that has made all of that possible. So um, I. I called Trevor, I said, hey, this, this is a message worth doing. And he made, well, is this a Thanksgiving message? Uh, yeah, kind of, because if you do this and you get victory over this, you're going to be thankful for the rest of your life because it's life-changing. So uh, we're going to dive into this. So have you ever felt like these kids in that marshmallow test? You, uh, you know, you dangled bait in front of any of us just so long, and we resist and we resist, and we resist, and then we cave. It's just part of the old nature. It's just who we are. And, uh, you know, we're Christ followers for the most part. And you know the Bible verses, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Um, make no provision for the lust of the flesh. Uh, be on your guard. The devil's like a roaring lion just looking for somebody to devour. But you still can't resist the marshmallow. Whatever the temptation is. You know, you're struggling. Let, let's just pick a top one today. You're struggling with, with porn. And you flip on the TV. Bam! Right there in your face. Or you go to a social media. Bang! First thing. There's this constant lure, and so before you know it, you're in trouble. Or you're struggling with alcohol, alcoholism. You find yourself in a crowd, and everybody's drinking. Now, this actually is a true story. And you think, just one drink. That won't hurt. But before you know it, you're right back in the pit you were to begin with. A guy that used to be a deacon of this church actually had that happen to him. And his life ended tragically just a few years ago as a raging, sad alcoholic. This last Tuesday evening, we were giving out meals. Thank you guys so much for that. That was such an awesome day. I kept giving out meals. Thanksgiving Day, I was still giving out meals. Remember the guy I told you I had, I had knew that I needed to reach out to and to care about and all of that a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago when I spoke to you and, and I said, but I haven't. And you guys all see this guy walking around the community all the time and you're like, and he's like invisible most. Well, Thursday or Tuesday night, I took him a meal and he took it and was very grateful and so Thanksgiving, I had another one left over from our outreach. I ran over and grabbed that to him. He was grateful again. He's probably wondering where I am today. Uh, <laughs> but, but as I told Trevor, I said, now, if this was a Baptist evangelistic story, I'd be saying, you know, the guy, I gave him his meals, and he gotten down on his knees, and he cried, and he repented, and he came to Christ, and then we called his family, and his whole family came to Jesus. But that's not what happened. <laughs> I handed him a meal. I got in my car, and I drove away. I handed him a meal on uh, Thanksgiving, and I got in my car, and I drove away. You go, well, why didn't you lead him to Jesus? Because I'm building a relationship, so I earn the time and the respect to be able to talk to him about Jesus at some point. That's it. You know, and, and then I did several of those. That was, it was kind of cool, but anyway, so Nikki and I were here, and Mike and um, Mike and Candace thought they were through early on when we wrapped everything up, and then we tried to take a bunch down to First Baptist. We gave them so much they couldn't handle it. So we decided, okay, let's call a sea base. So they took a bunch of meals. We gave them all that they could handle. We called the Coast Guard station and said, yeah, we can take them. So we ran a bunch up to the Coast Guard station, uh, the fire station in Alamorada. We, we were throwing meals out all over the place. But Nikki and I were here, 
Um, and I wasn't going to leave her here till, you know, spending the night in this place. And uh, so we had one set of meals to be picked up. I hadn't, didn't have any idea who it was. The car arrives, old beater car. Um, folks get out. I recognize the woman, and it literally took my breath away. This was a lady who was the wife of a prominent community leader in this community. Here she was coming to us asking for a Thanksgiving meal because she didn't have anything and the guy she was with didn't have anything. You could tell they were, they were destitute. The problem was this was the ex-wife of this prominent guy. The guy had had an affair. I saw it coming. I confronted the guy early on. He said, oh, no, 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 no. Nothing like that's going on. The years passed. The relationship continued. The family crashed. Now here's his ex-wife, completely impoverished. He's out of the area. And she's living in poverty, destroyed. And her kids, along with her, are destroyed, and they're completely estranged from their father. That's a real story in real life. So you understand why when I, when I give you the message, stop before you flop. It has real context for right now, for all of us. And there's a familiar character in the Bible, and he's a poster child for failing the marshmallow test. His name is Samson. I want you to listen to a story. I'm going to ask Larry to come up and read it to you. Um, Larry, grab uh, probably the white mic. All right. I, disclaimer, I did not pick Larry because he was the guy that I thought looked most like Samson or the guy that I thought was living most like Samson. He's just the guy that I thought of, hey, I'm going to call him and have him read the story. I used to, I used to have long hair. <laughs> yeah. A reading from Judges 16. One day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn we will kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up, took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with the two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Some time later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you could lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, if someone ties me up with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried and she tied, with him, tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to the flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. And then with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, all this time you've been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with the pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, 
and tightened it with a pin. And again she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin in the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you've made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to celebrate, saying, Our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their god, saying, our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste on our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for them. While they stood amongst the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the, feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached towards the two center pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and down the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. The way you talk about a tragic ending, you know, and what, a, what an epitaph. And how horrible would that be to have that be your epitaph, that you serve God's purposes more in your death than you did in your life? No, that's really what happened here with the, the story of Samson. But look where it started. Back in the verse, the first verse that was put up there, it says, one day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. And that's a summary sentence. One day, Samson went to Gaza, saw a prostitute, went in, spent the night with her. See, so many reasons that Gaza could ruin Samson's life. Not only was this the city where Samson could find prostitutes, Gaza was a center of the Philistines who hated God and who hated God's people. Not much has changed, by the way, over the course of history. And Samson was at the top of their hit list of all of these people. So this phrase, one day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute and went in and spent the night with her, makes it sound like all of a sudden Samson just goes, oh, I think I'll just cave into this lustful desire that I've had all of a sudden. I love the way Craig Rochelle says it. He says, like Samson woke up with nothing to do on one Sunday. It wasn't football season, so there was no game on TV. He checked Netflix, but couldn't find a show to watch. 
He thought about riding his Peloton, but wasn't in the mood. Then Samson had an idea. This never occurred to me before, but I'm pretty sure there are prostitutes in Gaza. I think I'll I'll head over there today. Listen, disaster almost never results in a single isolated decision. Write that down, frame that, remember that. It percolates. This is, this is the most important thing to get today. People, we, don't ruin our lives by making one big tragic step. It's never one. It's more like 56,250 steps. Do you remember that number for a few minutes? There's a bunch of summary statements like this throughout the Bible. Uh, but this one that we're looking at today is, is one of the most profound ones, Judges 16.1. And it, as we said, sadly summarizes Samson's life. Take a look at this map. Uh, this, this is, if you look up, see Bethlehem and then see Zoar, that's Samson's home. And then see Gaza down here. Same place that we're seeing in the news today. All right, so from Zoar to Gaza is about 25 miles. Want to take a wild guess how many steps there are on the average in 25 miles? 56,250. So what does that mean? Samson didn't ruin his life in just one disastrous moment or one disastrous step. Step by step, he was moving toward a life-destroying downward spiral. Craig says, long before he headed to Gaza that day, Samson must have allowed 56,250 thoughts little decisions, and self-defeating habits to deteriorate his relationship with God and his own integrity. You just heard Larry read the entire story about Samson. And you saw how Samson kept making a series of bad decisions and kept caving in to compromising habits that just kept pulling him further and further and further and ultimately led to a ruined life. Aren't you glad that never happens to any of us? Aren't you glad that these kinds of temptations are reserved just for people in the Bible? That they would never happen to modern, intelligent wise, always thinking correctly, people within a church. We would never fall in that kind of a pit, would we? Now, listen. We don't wreck our lives in one giant step, but one little step at a time. Now, I've been a a Christ follower a lot of years now, almost all of my adult life. And I can tell you that I can tell when there are these little decisions and little things going on in my life that I know if I don't turn the corner, they're going to trip me up. They're going to take me out of the race. I'd say this. I I look at, at Christian leadership, and I think everywhere I turn, I can think of someone that I know, that in some cases that I would call friends, that have fallen and have been a train wreck for the rest of their life. They gave up the very thing that God had given them, the, the, the prized thing of living their life for Him. And over one little step, they crashed and burned. My friends, the little compromises, the little things that you allow to creep into your life, 
Those are the very things that will take you out. 56,250 steps. So let's talk about how to prevent heading toward Gaza for a couple of minutes here. Number one, based on who you want to become, what's the one thing, remember that the one thing, the one habit, the one sin that you need to stop? What unhealthy, unhelpful, and perhaps ungodly habit is taking you in the direction that you don't want to go. Colossians 3, 1 through 3, and then verse 10, taken from the message. Listen to it. So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which, or pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Now you're dressed in the new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the creator with his label on it. All the old fashions are now obsolete. That old man that you used to want to be, that you used to live in, is gone. The Apostle Paul is telling us, forget about who you were. And that's a, that's a mistake that a lot of us make. We become Christians, and we spend a lot of our life going, wow, look at who I used to be. Look how bad I was, and look how far I've come. That's the wrong view. God wants you to go, look who I am now, and look how far I have to go. See the difference? Huge difference. Know who you are in Christ and what you want to become in Christ. How do we do that? Well, if you look at that same passage that I just read in Colossians 3, in the middle, you notice I left out uh, a whole pile of verses between verse 3 and verse 10. Uh, so here, here they are. Let me just read them to you. This is verses 5 through 9. And that means killing off everything connected with the way of death. Sounds like what Trevor has been reading to us for, what is it, about 150 weeks now? How many weeks have we been on the... On the, on the <laughs> how many? Two fifty. Okay, okay, good. All right. <laughs> so, 14. All right, and we're not through yet. So, this means killing off everything connected with the way of, of death. Sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like whenever you feel like it, and grabbing whatever attracts you, your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of of by God. You mean that's not okay to just go with my feelings? It just, if it feels good, do it. That's not okay? No, that's not okay when it doesn't agree with the things of God. It's because of this kind of thing that God is about to explode in anger. It wasn't long ago that you were doing all that stuff and not knowing any better. See, before we were Christians, we could say, oh, I just didn't know better. That's a lie, probably, because the Holy Spirit's been working on you throughout your entire life. But you see, he's given you some room here. But you know better now, so make sure it's all gone for good. Bad temper, irritability, meanness, profanity, dirty talk, don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes that you've stripped off and put in the fire. Now, who in their right mind, by the way, would want to pick up those old clothes and put them back on again? Probably all of us that have lived in the Christian life very long have picked up those old clothes and put them on at various times. This morning, I got behind a guy who was barely going 30 miles an hour. And the van behind him just couldn't stand anymore, boom, passed in the, uh, in the in no passing zone, which I was not about to do, uh, but I was aggravated, and I got closer to him, and my Holy Spirit, called Colleen, said, Tony Hammond, and so I backed up, and the guy behind me was in a Dodge Charger, 
and I hope you're not in the room right now because I'm about to call you out, uh, whipped around the, both of our cars, and as he got around the car in front of me, he offered up the fickle finger friendship salute as he went by, and the guy sped up to about 55 miles an hour. And uh, so but Colleen and I laughed, and, and I thought, yeah, but you know what? That's what I was thinking. <laughs> and it shows how quickly that can happen to us. So just be careful and, and don't get too smug about we all want to put on those old clothes again. Paul makes it pretty clear. If you want to become who Christ wants you to become, and that's really what we should be becoming, then clearly there are some habits and behaviors that we need to give up, all of us. So based on that, back to the original question, what is the one thing that you need to stop? Now, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, one? <laughs> I have a whole list. And if you focus on the list, you won't accomplish any. The evil one knows that if he can keep you focused on your list, on the whole bunch, you'll be overwhelmed and you won't focus on the one. And if you don't, you'll never take any of them on. Define the one, the one that you thought of just now, and go for it. You can't defeat what you can't define. You can't defeat what you can't define. So let's be honest. This is really hard. Quitting a bad habit. See, I've given you a lot of room here. I keep calling this a bad habit. Or, not to be so kind, or sin. To defeat those things in our life is really hard. In fact, it's nearly impossible on our own. Now, we're going to talk more about that in, in just a few minutes. It's re the reverse. Quitting a bad habit or a sin is the reverse of what habits or happens when you start a new habit. You realize that? It's, it's like working out. If I ask how many of you, when you first start, really enjoy working out. When I go to the gym, Colleen goes, have fun. And I go, eh, that's probably not the word for it. But I still get up and I still try to go every day. And you go in, and especially, you know, the first set, it's just painful. And then if you haven't worked out before and you worked out and you go home, there's nothing about that that you think, oh, this was so much fun, I want to do it again. But then you do it again, and 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 you get on the scales, and you lost one pound. You go, oh, my goodness. But you keep doing it, and you lose 25 pounds, and your body begins to change shape, and you begin to change. Now, that's what happens. So get this. Starting a good habit is hard at first. But you have to keep going. And what happens if you keep doing that? There's a good result at the end, right? There's a payday. There's a payoff for doing that. So the opposite is true when you're trying to take on a bad habit. We're trying to quit a bad habit. See, here's what happens. With a bad habit or with sin, the gratification comes now, true, and the pain comes in the future. Let me tell you the biggest lie that you could believe. There will not be any payday. There will not be any pain in the end. Nobody knows. I can't get caught. Nobody will find out. Where do you think that lie is coming from? Back in the Garden of Eden, same thing happened to Eve, didn't it? Hey, God's holding out on you. 
Did you know? You can be like God. He just doesn't want you to have any fun. Do this. Did he really say? That's the, that's the favorite thing. You know, people always say, well, who defines what sin is? God does. On the Holy Spirit poking you. That's who does. But see, the evil one whispers that kind of lie. You won't get caught. It's no big deal. You'll, you'll be like God. You'll have more pleasure than you can imagine. Go ahead. Why is it so? Because a habit or a sin is enjoyable. Sin can be fun. We wouldn't sin if that were not so. As, as Craig Rochelle says, I love you, he goes, if you don't think sin can be fun, you're not doing it right. <laughs> it's just the truth of it. If doing wrong was never enjoyable, we would never do it. It's fun now, but it messes you up later. Remember, tough as all get out to start a good habit but there's good result in the end. The opposite is true with giving up a bad habit or a sin. Fun is all get out at the beginning. You know, I, I, you know I'm not picking on Baptists, but remember the old Baptist phrase, be sorry for all sin? Oh, it leaves me out. I'm not sorry for all sin. I'm sorry for what sin did to Jesus. But I look back on some of the things that, you know, there's a kind of fun. You know, thinking about giving that friendly salute to the guy in the car in front of me this morning felt like fun. But it would have been really bad if I'd have pulled in here and the guy would have, in front of me would have been pulling in the parking lot with me, wouldn't it? <laughs> so just don't kid yourself about that, you know. Fun now, but it'll mess you up later. Number two, to stop a bad habit, make it difficult to do. Huh? That's what's, what Solomon says in this next passage. He says the same thing in six different ways. Listen to this in Proverbs 4, verses 4, 14 and 15. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. Did you get them all? You have to go back and read the passage to get them. Stop. To stop a bad habit, you need to make it difficult to do. He's saying, remove the cue. If you've been around anybody that's talked about getting rid of bad habits. You've, you've heard that language. You stop cues. Cues cause you to sin. Cues cause you to stumble. Cues are reminders that cause you to step into the craving that you're having. And that craving then leads to your response. Dangerous, dangerous territory. So what we need to do is find a new cue. Like the passage we just talked about. Or we remove the trigger that leads to sin and replace it with a new trigger. Look at this verse. This is one that I learned very early on and I, and I guarantee you that Trevor learned this in our school very early on and Lacey learned this in school very early on. Proverbs 119.11. We learned it, thy word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. In the NIV, it's I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I can't tell you how many times that I thought about sinning and a passage of scripture pops into my head. Oh, Lord, would you leave me alone right now? 
Now, I want to have this attitude. I want to be angry. I want to do whatever. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Don't stay and argue with the evil one or tempt yourself. Sometimes we just need to run. Remember the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife? When she grabbed his coat, what did he do? He ran. That's the response that we need to have a lot of times. Paul instructing young Timothy. He called his spiritual son. In 1 Timothy 6, 11, he says, But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, good godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Again, sounds like those passages we've been studying. But the beginning, he says, flee from all this, meaning sin. Sometimes you just need to flee from it. You know, years ago, I made a promise. I, came from, I come from a long line of alcoholics in my family and was well on the way as a high school kid, a junior high kid, to be real honest with you, um, to just fall into the ditch as a young adult. And I met Colleen, who was this good Catholic girl that said, you need to make a choice. It's going to have to be this or it's going to be me. And I said, well, that's a pretty simple choice. And then I became a Christian. And I carried that step one more step further because I was teaching at Coral Shores. And I thought, I need to be an example, a role model of these kids. And I made God a promise. Man, that's a crazy thing to do. Be careful about making a promise to God. I said, I'm just not going to let, I'm not going to let a drop of alcohol touch my lips. Because I'm afraid if I do, I'll be in the ditch. So I quit. I made a promise to God. I can't go back on a promise. Just not going to do it. Especially to God. That's my way of saying I had to run from it. I had to flee from it. That's not saying I'm, I'm not being critical of somebody who has a beer or drinks wine or whatever. That's not the issue. For me, it was one of those triggers and cues David and some of the rest of you that are in this room can tell you what stupid things I did as a young kid and know that almost all of them had to do with too many beers on top of it. You know. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. <laughs> you, think that you think you're the first one that that's just happened to? <laughs> Got a cute clue. It's happened to a bunch of us. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, will also make the way of escape. There's that flea again. Don't say, I just can't help it. God says, I've given you a way out that you may be able to bear it. Remember, as a Christ follower, this is so key. God has given us a way to stop before we flop. Listen to what it says in Colossians 5, verses 16 and 17. So I say, walk by the Spirit. what Pastor Trevor's been teaching the last several weeks. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Next time you're about to set your eyes on something that don't honor God, that are just honoring to God, invite the Holy Spirit to sit down and look at it with you. Ooh. You know, He's doing it anyway. You are dragging the third person of the Trinity into the mire with you. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. (laughs) But Lord, I want it. That's what Samson said. 
How many times did he say that? Over 50,000, right? And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh, they're in conflict with each other so that you are, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Don't cave into that. You may say, I just can't get victory over you fill in the blank. It's because you're trying to do it under your own power, in the power of the flesh. Your flesh feels good, so that's the wrong place to go. You've got to figure out how to eliminate cues. I'm going to give you some steps in a minute to do that. And when you learn to walk in the Spirit, you're no longer fighting your battle under your own power, but under the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you some slides. John, let's go ahead and, and throw those up, those last ones. Take a look at these. Take a picture of them. I was going to run these off for you. Now I'll just let people that want them take a picture of them. But these are, are the stop before you plot steps. What's the one habit you know you most need to stop? What do you need to quit doing? What is the best thing that could happen if you're successful and you quit. Think of the outcome. I'll be happily married. I'll have a happy family. My children and their children and their children's children and their children's children, as Ethan just sang about and we all sang about a few minutes ago, will be blessed. <clears throat> What's the best thing that could happen? The next one. What is the worst thing that could happen if you continue or get worse? Take, take whatever it is you're thinking about and just extend it. It's not going to ha have a happy ending, is it? <laughs> when you think about stopping, what is your rationalization for continuing? Ooh. Time to change cues. Time to change triggers. And the last one then. What cues regularly create triggers for your habits? Got to avoid those. Put in new ones. So today I've talked a lot to the body of Christ. Just, we're going to pray in about two seconds. But I just want you to hear this. If you haven't understood that God loves you, he's not, he's not just looking for the opportunity to whack the daylights out of you. He wants you to be what he designed you to be and created you to be. He says it's God's desire that all men would be saved. Men, men and women, by the way, that would be saved. And he loves you so much that he doesn't want you to have to live like that. So he sent his son to die on the cross. And he took every ounce of sin that we have committed, that we will commit, that we're thinking about committing, and he put them on Jesus. When Jesus died and said, it is finished, it is paid in full, the bill has been settled, he was making a complete payment for all of our sins. And the only thing left for us to do is to receive by faith that gift that he's offering to us. The transaction that takes place between you and a holy God where you simply say, God, I know that I sin. I know that I foul up. I know that I make mistakes. And I believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Savior. I believe he died and paid for my sin, all of my sin. That's what the Bible says. I'd love to spend more time showing it to you if you need more time to wrap around this. But, boy, if you're ready, this is the time to do it. I mean, right now, right here, seated, just say, Lord, I need you. I believe that Jesus died for me. I'm accepting you right now in this moment, in this second. That's it. You say, but we didn't bow just then. You don't have to. 
You know what? I got saved. I didn't hear bells and whistles. There were no rockets going up in the air or anything like that. It was just like, oh, wow. I get it. I get it. I'm going to lead you in prayer in a minute. Just give you the opportunity to sort of nail that down. But I'm also going to pray for those of us that have been Christians for a while. Because I bet today, at least some of you have gone, oh, man, yeah, you just hit something I really need to work on. And I'm just going to give you a moment of prayer time for that. All right? So let's bow together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come this morning thanking you for your amazing love. Thank you that it says in the way we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not after we cleaned up our act. Not after we got our stuff together. But you loved us enough with all our flaws, with all our sin, to send your son to die for us. And Father, I just want to invite anyone who has not done that before right now in this opportunity, Lord, to just to be able to say, yes, Lord. I want to accept that today. I want to make it mine. I'm accepting his forgiveness. I believe Jesus is my Savior, that he died for all of my sin. And this morning, as best I can understand it and know how, I'm accepting that gift today. Just have that conversation with your Heavenly Father. If you receive that gift this morning, you want to receive that gift, we just put your hand up and put it right down. I won't call out to you. I'm not going to come to you or draw attention to you. But just hold your hand up for a second. Let me see it. Anyone at all this morning? All right. Thank you. Now let's shift gears to the body of Christ for a minute. Some of us have been Christians for a lot of years. But truth be told, we have plenty of stuff that gets in the way of being who Christ wants us to be. So this morning, if something came to mind that you know that you need to confess, you need to get victory over, one thing, just lay it out there before God right now. Say, dear God, this is it. I'm handing this up to you. I need your spirit to help me. I need to remove the cues and triggers that are causing me to stumble from being what I know I don't want to be. I don't want the end of my life to end tragically or the end of my family or the end of my relationships. I want my life to matter for you. If you just say, Pastor, I, I just, I could use some extra prayer this morning. Would you just, I'm just going to ask you to slip your hand up and put it down. I'm just hold it up for a second. Let me have a chance to see it just so I can kind of remember you. Say, yeah, I, I need some help in these areas. Yeah, I see several hands this morning. Ultimately, you have to take this to the Lord. And call on him, find programs that will help you with us. There's all over the place. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come before you today and worship you. Thank you for this body that's here today and for all that's taken place. We pray your blessing. Very special way in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody.